Greetings, teammates. It's been quite a while since I sat down with Dr. Elena Wild, our public health emergency officer, and frankly, a lot has changed since we last did. Doc Wild, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you also for all that you have done throughout this entire period uh, that we've been dealing with COVID-19. We could not be where we are without you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's my privilege and my honor. So teammates, right now we find ourselves in health protection condition, bravo. We are still in a public health emergency, but the local conditions in our community are starting to trend in a positive direction. We also have a vaccine. But before we get into the details of the vaccine, let me ask you, why do we need a vaccine if wearing a mask and hand washing and socially distancing are working? Well, so they are working, but we need to employ absolutely every tool that we have in our toolbox to be able to effectively combat this virus. While the non-pharmaceutical interventions like uh, hand washing and mask wear and social distancing do make a significant impact, they're very hard to maintain 100% of the time, and uh, there's also a lot of fatigue with maintaining those kind of things. The vaccines are a additional, incredibly good measure to take to be able to reduce the spread of this virus and to also make increased herd immunity. So uh, to increase not only the people who are immune from having had the virus, but also having immunity from a vaccine, which add to all of those other interventions like the mask wear and the hand cleaning and et cetera and the social distancing. Using every tool in the arsenal is critical in order to be able to defeat this virus. And the vaccine is one of the biggest guns that we have, sir. So that makes absolutely perfect sense to me. But the question that I get all the time from older people, from younger people, from women, from men is this, is the vaccine safe? Yes, sir. We have done extensive studies um, all over the world with literally thousands and thousands of people volunteering for these studies. And all of the evidence that we have to date is that it is safe. There are risks for things like an allergic reaction to the vaccine, which is a risk for any vaccine or medicine or substance you put in your body, bee stings, for example. So there are those kind of risks, uh, which we're familiar with, but overall, all of the studies are showing that the vaccines that have been FDA approved, or even those that are close to being approved, are safe when it comes to their impact on the human body and, and, their, and their response to the virus. Okay, so, so they're safe, but are they effective? They are very effective as far as we are aware with these new ones with the mRNA that have been F FDA approved with an EUA, so an emergency authorization from the FDA. Um, the data so far is showing anywhere above 90 to 95% effective for both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. Um, they are effective within about 14 days of the initial dose and very effective within about seven to 14 days of the second dose. Both of these are the ones that need boosters. We think pro probably up to about seven, sorry, about 98% effective uh, for both of these if you've had both boosters. Now, we are continuing to study these vaccines. And of course, the caveat to all of this is this is all subject to change, right? These are very new vaccines and we need more time and more studies to continue to monitor them. But so far as we're aware now, they're very effective, well over 90% for the Moderna and the Pfizer so far, the ones that are uh, FDA approved at preventing COVID for a period of time. Since you brought up both Moderna and Pfizer, can you talk to the differences between the two? Absolutely, sir. So they both are what we call mRNA vaccines, so messenger RNA vaccines. The way that a messenger RNA vaccine works is basically it's a blueprint of a protein that the virus has that our body will use to create, to recognize and to create antibodies to that virus. Um, the biggest differences are with the Moderna and the Pfizer, basically storage. So distribution um, is, is one of the things that uh, is relevant when we talk about the difference between Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, the Moderna does not need to be kept at significantly cold temperatures like the Pfizer does. Um, and those are the biggest differences really are storage as, as well as the time that you can distribute those, those two vaccines. The other types of vaccines include weakened versions of the virus that are carried in by an adenovirus, for example, but those have not been all FDA approved at this time. Uh, one example is the AstraZeneca, which they have actually started to roll out in the UK. 
Um, and then there's the Johnson & Johnson and other, other variants. But the mRNA are the Pfizer as well as the Moderna. Um, and then there's an SSRNA as well, but that hasn't come to the market just yet. So Doc, let me ask you this. As it relates to Moderna and Pfizer, can I contract COVID-19 from taking these vaccines and does it in any way affect my DNA? Does it alter or change it? That's a very good question, sir, and it's one that we get a lot of. Um, the answer is no to both of those. Um, there is no way you can contract COVID from an mRNA vaccine. It is a blueprint. It is not actually the virus itself. Um, so it's a blueprint of a protein, particularly the spike protein, uh, that your body will recognize and create antibodies to. A lot of the prompt for these kind of questions comes from some of the side effects that we see with these viruses. So some of these side effects look like an, an infection, like a respiratory virus. For example, you can have fatigue. Uh, you definitely can have some muscle pain at the site of the injection. Uh, some people will have headache, body aches, those kind of things. They're not very common and they don't usually last very long. Um, but those kind of symptoms make people worried that, well, I'm, I feel sick. Potentially this is because I have contracted the virus from the vaccine. Not possible with this vaccine. Um, it is a sign that your body is doing what it's meant to do. It's recognizing something and creating an immune response, which is going to do things like increase your temperature. That's how our body kills viruses and bacteria. Areas. So it's a, it's a natural response, not to the virus, but to an immune response from the, from the body. Um, and then the other question about whether or not it will change your DNA, it is a blueprint of an mRNA of a viral spike protein. There is no evidence that it would be able to change our DNA. Our DNA is hardwired, if you will. So it's very unlikely to be able to do that. Okay, so, so help me out with this. Will the vaccine prevent me from contracting COVID-19 or, or and, will it prevent me from spreading it to my family? Yes, sir, the vaccine will to a large extent prevent you from both contracting the virus and spreading the virus. Like we spoke about the effectiveness of these vaccines is pretty much almost unheard of in the history of vaccines. To get a vaccine that is close to 98 or higher percent effective as far as we know right now, but definitely over 90% effective, means that it is 90% effective at preventing you from contracting the virus. Now that's not 100%, but it's as close as we've been with a vaccine for a very long time. Um, so it will prevent you from potentially getting the virus. And if you don't get it, it's very effective at preventing you from spreading it. But it's not 100%. There is still a very small risk um, and like we said, all of these are very new vaccines. We need more time to get a better understanding of how long they're going to give us protection. Are we going to be 90% protected for a long time? Which means that we need to watch it as we go. But for now, within those first few months, we know that there's a very good chance that it's protecting both you and therefore protecting other people around you because if you don't have it, it's very unlikely that you can spread it. So Doc, we've already talked about this, but I want to further elaborate on the side effects. How likely am I to get one of those side effects? And if I do, what, which one would I most likely get? So that's a good question, sir. There are, there are many sites that people can go to if they, if they would like to see the actual layout because there's different percent likelihood for different side effects. The one that you're gonna see the most of is pain at the site of the injection. So for the most part, we're giving this in the right deltoid. We use your right arm because you tend to use that arm a little bit more for most right-handed people. Um, and movement of that arm really helps with that. But that is one of the side effects that we're seeing a lot of is obviously pain at the injection site, which is not unique to this vaccine. You often will have some pain at an injection site for, for many other vaccines. Um, other side effects that are quite common are fatigue. That's another one that you see a fair amount of. Uh, some people will have um, joint pain, muscle pain, including fatigue, occasionally things like headache. But there's a full list of those on the CDC website. If you just type in CDC COVID-19 vaccine side effects, it'll give you an, a breakdown of all of the different side effects and the percentage of risk for all of those side effects. For some of them, it's relatively high, like for example, the muscle pain, that risk of having that side effect is, is relatively high because it's a likely side effect as well as things like fatigue. But the more severe side effects, for example, an allergic reaction are extremely, extremely low. So it's a broad spectrum of side effects with different risk factors for each, but the ones that we're seeing the most of are pain at the site, fatigue, some muscle aches, some headaches, but they usually don't last more than a day or two. 
Doc, if I do get one of those adverse reactions, the severe reactions, how do I report that? So there are links on the CDC website. There is actually an app on the phone that you can download and it will actually text you every day. I think my phone just beeped at me this morning actually. <laughs> text you every day to see how are your symptoms doing today. Um, there are multiple other links through the facilities that we work at. For example, through this facility you can always call in and speak to your primary care manager or speak to one of the nurses. Um, even the public health department will help you with that. We can help you place those reports and etc. Now if it is a bad adverse reaction. We do want you always to seek emergency care if it's significant, if you're having problems breathing or anything along those lines, signs of a bad allergic reaction. We want you to call 911 and get emergency help with that or present to an emergency room. Um, but for most of the milder side effects, which are you know, the headache and the fatigue and the joint pain and those kind of things. Those can be reported on the app that's available through the CDC, through your public health department, through your PCM, through basically any medical provider can help you figure that out. But as well, if you just go to the CDC and you type in vaccine, it's going to bring all of that up as well as the app that you can log into on a daily basis. That's fantastic, Doc. So let me switch gears a little bit and ask you this. What about those that are pregnant or nursing? Can they and should they get the vaccine? We strongly encourage that people who are pregnant and nursing speak to their provider, their OB or their family medicine provider or whoever's taking care of them during that pregnancy or during that early postpartum term about the risks associated with getting a vaccine during pregnancy. And that goes for any vaccine. Um, there are several that we know are safe. With the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine that are now FDA approved, there is no evidence that it is harmful to a pregnant patient or to a, a breastfeeding mother. But the truth is the studies have not been going on long enough for us to have any really good data there to make a, a strong recommendation with regards to long-term side effects and long-term potential outcomes. The reality is with this type of vaccine, the science is pretty solid behind it that we think that there are very low risks for a pregnant patient to get this vaccine in comparison to the risks associated with getting the coronavirus while pregnant, which can have other, other comorbidities, um, things like blood clots, for example, preterm labor, low birth weight. We know that pregnant patients can have some pretty negative side effects from having COVID, pretty significant impact from having COVID itself in comparison to the vaccine, the risk of the vaccine appears to be lower. So organizations such as the CDC, ACOG and many other um, organizations around the world, including the World Health Organization, recommend that pregnant women have that conversation and if they meet the criteria for getting the vaccine based on their risk or, for example, healthcare workers, that they strongly recommend that they still get this vaccine. But it is a conversation that you need to be having with your primary care provider to decide what are your risks and which is the bigger risk? Um, with regards to breastfeeding, it probably does cause for the, the antibodies to cross into the breast milk, but that is not a bad thing. We think that most antibodies crossing the breast milk will actually provide perfect protection for the infant. Um, for example, we give you a, a Tdap shot in your later term of pregnancy in order for you to actually give those antibodies to your infant when you're breastfeeding. So potentially that's going to help as well with regards to making babies more immune if a mother's been vaccinated and she's breastfeeding. But again, we do not have those long-term studies to effectively discuss the safety of that. But overall, we think that it is probably safe to do, but it's a conversation that every person needs to have with their primary care provider or their OB provider or their pediatrician. How soon after someone is vaccinated are they protected? So within the first two weeks of the first shot, we know that there is some immunity, um, but within seven to 14 days of the second shot of the series, whether that is the Pfizer or the Moderna, we know that you are close to that 90 or higher percent immune response from those vaccines. Let me pull the thread a little bit more. So how much protection do I have after my first shot? So the studies are showing that that could be anywhere up to 70% um, after the first shot alone. But the trick is that we don't know, A, how long that will last, and B, if that truly is going to be as effective. Um, obviously, if we can get over 90%, that's the goal. Um, but for all of these studies and the long-term data that we have, which again is not very long-term at this point, seems these are very new vaccines, 
the effectiveness of just one shot and how long that's going to last is not very clear. We know that the second shot will get you to above 90% for a period of time. So the first shot, anywhere up to 70%, but we don't know how long that's going to last or how effective that is really. It shows only that you have those antibodies and that you're 70% unlikely so far as we know right now from that data. But this is subject to change as we learn more about the virus and about the vaccines. Another question that's circulating is this, do I have to get my shot on exactly the 28th day for Moderna or the 21st day for Pfizer? You know, in other words, how much grace period do I have before I'm forced to start all over again? That's another good question. And one of the things that we're looking at with regards to both of these vaccines are uh, the one that we have rolled out here at Offutt Air Force Base is the Moderna. Um, so we're looking very closely at what our window is for that. So far as we know right now, based on the studies of the Moderna vaccine, there is a window of four days early to approximately 42 days later based on the Moderna studies. So there is a window of that 24 days to 42 days approximately. The goal is of course to get you in as close to the 28 days as we can because that's where all of the data is. The more that you stretch out to those edges, you're getting to the edge of that bell curve and the less we know about its long-term effect and how immune you're going to be from it. But there is a window and with this vaccine particularly that we're using, it's about four to 42 days, four days before to 42 days total. Um, and the Pfizer is similar, but we're waiting for more data to come out on, the, on those studies. Perhaps the most popular question that I receive is how long will I be protected from the, the virus as a function of getting the vaccine? And that's a very good question too, sir, and one that we get every time I put a shot in somebody's arm. Um, we know, based on the time span that we've had now, since we rolled out these vi the, the, the vaccines in humans in those early studies, that you're probably gonna get at least 90 days. This vaccine came to us gratefully very quickly, um, it, unprecedented times and an unprecedented turnout of a vaccine, which we're truly grateful for because it's gonna turn the tide of this, of this pandemic. But the price that we pay for a vaccine that's rolled out that quickly is we need to continue to monitor it. We just haven't had the time yet to really understand what it's going to be from long-term immunity. When we look at it in reality, we don't really even understand long-term immunity that is acquired naturally from this virus because this virus is so new. We're going into our first year of dealing with it here in the States in, in February. So we don't know, for example, from natural immunity, how long you're gonna be immune yet because all of this is so new. But what we do know is that the studies are showing so far, it's at least 90 days. It is probably much longer than that. We're looking now at those people who are at six months out and they're showing that they also have antibodies. Um, so there's, a, there's hope that it's going to last much longer than that. And you know, best case scenario, we only get a booster every once in a while. But the truth is we just don't have that data yet to have a really good idea of when we're going to need another shot, if we're going to need another shot, does it need to be two shots. But we're looking at that. And as the studies move forward and the data comes in, we're going to get more and more information on that. So what if I've already had COVID? Do I need to get vaccinated? Yes, you do. Um, it is one of the things that we are looking at as we move forward as well with more studies and more data. Um, it is feasible for you to delay that if you should choose to, but the recommendation is still to get it. The reason being is that we, again, don't really understand the long-term immunity from natural immunity from a COVID infection because we haven't had that much time with it yet. Um, so if you get both the vaccine and COVID, there is a likelihood that you're, you're gonna have an even stronger immune response and better immunity to it. Of course, we don't know that for sure, but the recommendation is to get it based on the fact that the vaccine is gonna give you potentially longer immunity based on when you've had COVID and et cetera. But there is, there is a recommendation that everybody who has had the coronavirus by the CDC and the World Health Organization still get the vaccine to ensure immunity because we don't know how immune you were from the coronavirus. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is not everybody has had a positive test and just assume they've had the coronavirus and et cetera. So those are reasons definitely to get it. Um, but also that it is potentially going to increase the length of immunity that you that you can achieve from both the vaccine and the coronavirus itself. Last question, and perhaps the million dollar question is this. If I'm vaccinated, do I still need to wear a mask? 
and do I still need to socially distant? Yes, sir. So far as we know, at this point of time, it's far too early for us to be making big changes to change our non-pharmaceutical interventions. While we are very certain that this gives really good immunity, these vaccines really do help with that, not everybody's been vaccinated. Not everybody will be vaccinated. Some people would rather wait a while and see what the long-term effects are before they go ahead and get a vaccine. So without everybody being vaccinated and us not knowing who is or who isn't, things like mask wear, social distancing, and et cetera, should absolutely continue. And as we discussed, while the vaccine is very effective, it's not 100% effective. There is still a small chance. So the more things we can do to get us to closer to that 100% reduced risk, the better. And that would include continuing to wear masks and things along those lines. Uh, herd immunity is something that we talk about a lot. Um, and until we achieve what is considered a good level of herd immunity, we really shouldn't change any of the other interventions that we have. That while the vaccine is an incredible tool, um, it's an incredibly powerful tool, it's very early for us to just drop all of our other pr practices that keep us safe. Once we reach more herd immunity, once we have a better understanding of the vaccine, how long-term immunity works, once we have a better understanding of new mutations, for example, that's when we can talk about doing things like changing mask wear, um, social distancing, opening things back up to 100% and et cetera, et cetera. Doc, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much again this morning for being with us and for everything that you've done. Thank you, sir. Anything you would like to add before we close? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, we are, like we said earlier, uh, going into one year of, of dealing with this virus here at Orford Air Force Base. And I just want to encourage everybody to continue to do everything that we have been doing, like I do every time. And I appreciate how much everybody has been doing, how hard everybody has been working, and how hard everybody has been trying, and all of the sacrifices made from the beginning of this to continue to keep us all safe. The light is at the end of the tunnel. We have a vaccine. We are seeing the numbers go down. We are winning, but we need to keep fighting and we need to keep doing all of the things that we're doing to keep ourselves and our family safe. So I thank everybody for everything they've done so far and I encourage you to stay the course and keep fighting the fight because we are winning. Doc, thank you very much. Teammates, Thank you once again for your patience and your support and understanding. As you have learned here today, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and we are starting to see it. Please continue to follow CDC directed guidelines and when you have the opportunity to get the vaccine, please do so. It is safe and it's absolutely the right thing to do in order to help us get back to normal. Thank you for everything that you're doing to protect yourself, your friends, your family, your unit, our mission and our installation. As Doc Wall said, let's stay the course and let's finish strong. World class is our standard. Thank you.